This is Dr. Weich Coleman, video six of six in the basic cataract series. And this is basically the final steps of cataract surgery. We've gone through separately making incisions, capsule rectus, hydrodissection, nucleus removal, uh, cortex removal, all using the divide and conquer technique. So this is closing up. And the interesting thing about this is this is the longest video. So, um, Although I think you can't alter the speed of this that much. Um, I think people who do not use ProVisc at the end of the case and uh, just use uh, uh, BSS, you can probably speed it up a little bit. I may look towards doing that at some point in the future after realizing how long this step, these steps take. This video series has been informative to me to try to analyze where I'm wasting time surgically and where I may can improve my average case time. On these videos, I think is about six and a half minutes, um, maybe seven, somewhere in that range, which is pretty good, but there's always room for improvement. Although I uh, was taught by my mentor, two things that were key to ca good cataract surgery. Number one is perfect is the enemy of good, and number two, slow is smooth and smooth is fast, and I always keep those two things in mind. Uh, the fastest cataract cases I've ever done certainly have been the ones where I was not trying to go fast. My current personal record is four minutes and 22 seconds, and I get a lot sub five minutes, but if I look at the clock and think about uh, how long it's taking, the, I inevitably am moving slower. And if you want to see what the total case time is, um, on, on these, you can look at the counter in the top left corner on the Ingenuity. So that's the total time, and this one's seven minutes, so we'll see what the average is. So, in general, I mean, I talk through these cases, as I've done in the previous ones, not necessarily in the order that's occurring on the screen, at least initially. So, you know, the, the key to getting a wound that seals well is to have a well-constructed wound to start with. We all know that. If you have a long wound, if you have a short wound, they can torture you the whole case, for different reasons. So every step builds on the previous step and trying to get consistency surrounding those steps is critical. That's the reason that I made these videos. So if you're struggling with one step and you'll notice through your career that you'll have something perfected and then one day your paracentesis wounds are leaking and you have no idea why, hopefully you can go back and watch this video and maybe help identify the problem. Um, that's happened to me several times where I hit a mental block and you know, Nothing's perfect, and you get better over time, and consistency gets better. And at some point, you don't have those problems anymore. Um, for for the record, I'm about a little under 20,000 cases in at this point. I'm 12 years into practice. Um, I still feel like I'm still improving. Um, you know, obviously, improvement is very fast early on and slower later. If you're at a program uh, or you were trained in a technique that's different than this, I would encourage everybody to adopt this technique. Our, uh, myself, my partner, do the same technique. We were trained at LSU Shreveport. Essentially, all the cataract surgeons from there use a similar technique. Um, my uh, capsule rupture rate in an uncomplicated case is l less than one per thousand. So is my partner, Chris Shelby. So I think this technique is uh, efficient, and it's very safe, and it works on 99% of eyes. As I said before, if you can't FACO it using this technique, it's probably time to do SICS. You're not going to be able to FACO it at all. So, filling the eye with viscoelastic. When we get the cortex removed, we're, we're ready for lens insertion. We don't want to just fill the anterior chamber because that's a common, that's a common technique flaw I see with the residents and, and our fellows in their early stages of training. By the way, we do offer a cataract refractive fellowship for one year. If you're finishing residency and you watch these videos and liked them, please apply for it. Um, get some real world coaching and I promise you will perfect this technique. Um, our current fellow is doing cases that are about the same amount of time. I watch him operate sometimes and I think if you showed me a video of his, him operating, I would not know it wasn't me. Um, so I think his technique's ex excellent. Check out our fellowship, Willis Knight Nye Institute, Shreveport, Louisiana. Not an illustrious town, but pretty good training. So the uh, filling with viscoelastic, we want to make sure that we don't just fill the anterior chamber. You do want to fill some anterior chamber, but you don't want to push the anterior capsule leaflet back and collapse the bag. That's where you're going to put the lens in just a second. So you want to create some space there. 
Now, we worry about pointing the, the uh, cannula tip posterior because we don't want to rupture the capsule at the end of the case. We don't want the cannula tip to go through the posterior capsule. Remember, if you are injecting, if you are actively injecting viscoelastic, the, uh, and this is, this is provisc, um, cohesive rather than dispersive viscoelastic, whichever one you use is fine. I have no strong preference over, uh, uh, uh between the different viscoelastic products. Um, the, you want to make sure that you remember that you've got to, if you have a fluid wave, if you are actively injecting, you cannot puncture the capsule because there's a fluid wave propagating in front of the cannula tip where the puncture would have to occur. You'd have to do something very aggressive. So the time that you would puncture the capsule with the cannula is when you're not injecting and you're posting, pointing posterior. So I always want to inject a little bit of viscoelastic in the anterior chamber and then fill the bag and then let the eye fill back up from that direction. And when it starts burping back out the main wound, I think you're pretty much done. You know, another, another point would be to look at the paracentesis wound before you decide to go through the main wound to inject your viscoelastic because a lot of times you'll have a small piece of nucleus that gets stuck at that paracentesis and you don't realize it until you hydrodissect the paracentesis at the end. Then you got to get the IA back out, go back in the eye, reseal the wounds, start the process over. The way to avoid that is to inject your viscoelastic through the paracentesis. Works fine. Um, and that way you get that small piece of nucleus moving and uh, out in the open where you can get it as you're removing your viscoelastic and you don't have to do it as a separate distinct step. So viscoelastic is injected typically through the main wound, through the paracentesis if you need it to dislodge a small piece of nucleus that's stuck there. I inject bevel up. I do not stabilize the eye. I can stabilize the eye by pointing down with my lens injector with the, with the end of the cartridge. And I usually do not have to use a second instrument in the paracentesis to stabilize the eye. I think it makes a paracentesis leak slightly more often to do that. Now, my partner differs on this. He uses uh, a, the Connor in the paracentesis to stabilize the eye and, and goes in bevel down rather than bevel up. If I said bevel down, I, I go bevel up, he goes bevel down. Both seem to work fine. The theory that you want to go that that you need to go bevel up comes from the idea that you're going to nick the endothelium by going bevel down. I'm not sure that's really true. I think the the nicking of the endothelium occurs with the phaco tip, and I'm more careful to insert it with some down trajectory to not nick the epithelium and and dislodge or the endothelium and dislodge some of it there. So I think bevel up, bevel down is fine. I think stabilizing in the para is fine. Uh, but I do not think it is necessary. I generally prefer my technique. So once the lens is injected, um, you know, we want it to go in the capsule bag, but not point so deep. You're only pointing down to the point that you get it under the anterior capsule leaflet. That's where it's got to be. Don't keep pushing down and, 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 and bulldoze through the posterior capsule. I've seen it, ha I've seen it happen a couple times um, in resident cases. So once it's under the anterior leaflet, then you can flatten out and just push it equatorial. Um, you don't want the whole capsule bag complex to move as, the, as you're injecting in. So if you see that happening, that's when you start coming out of the eye in the final portion of the injection so you don't de destabilize zonules right at the end of the case. We'll talk this one through as it's going. So viscoelastic into the anterior chamber. Now I'm pointing posterior to make sure that we adequately fill the capsule bag. If you're doing an aura, getting uniform fill is really critical too. So bevel up, no second instrument, leading haptic. Remember it's going to go clockwise, whichever way it's loaded. It should be loaded facing up, like rolled up like a taco. Sometimes it's not. Be aware, have to, you can rotate if you have to. And, you know, if you're using silicone lenses, light adjustable lenses, three-piece lenses, they come out in more of an explosion rather than a controlled way like a single-piece lens. So sometimes a lot more rotation is required. So to remove the viscoelastic, I'm removing it in the anterior chamber, anterior to the lens first. I'm always going behind the lens. And that's a scooching over of the lens motion. You want to push down on it and scoot it over and then sneak in behind it. We want to move it uh, out of the way the minimal amount so we don't disrupt and stretch zonules 
to get behind the lens. Is it absolutely necessary to go behind the lens? I don't think it is, but if you're more than 100 cases in, I think that's the time that a resident should start going behind the lens to get the viscoelastic out because especially with a toric, it's going to give it a it's going to give you a pivot point to rotate on. I think it's more likely for a toric to rotate if you don't get adequate viscoelastic removal. So I think going behind the lens is a good idea. Now, if you have a complicated case, uh, if you end up doing a vitrectomy, putting the lens in the sulcus, if you're if you're worried that it, everything's destabilized, if you use a capsular tension ring, which I'm a big fan of, don't feel pressure to go behind the lens. Leave all the viscoelastics you, you want, and if they're not a contraindication, give them give the patient diamox, give them topical drops, give them combigan. Uh, don't push a bad situation trying to get every little bit of viscoelastic out of the eye. If you use diamox, their pressure will come down. Okay, so we're filling the anterior chamber, caps her bag, bevel up. Try to get the bubbles out of the end of the cartridge before I go in so I don't end up with a big bubble sitting right in the middle of my view. I'm going under the anterior capsule leaflet, making sure it's there. Again, the Connor one, I think it's the most versatile instrument ever made. Handles the lens just fine. Pushing it into the posterior chamber. Letting the haptics fold out slightly. It's important not to load the lens too long before you put it in or it'll take a long time to unfold, especially if your OR is cold. We're going to go in and wash in the anterior chamber. I'm going to rock as I do. And uh, if there were any small pieces of nucleus hiding, I want to stir them up now. I'm going to scoot the lens over to the left, lift up behind it. And I said in my video about cortex that almost the only time that capsule poster capsule is engaged is when the when the port when the hole at the end of the IA tip is turned to the sideways or facing down so you've got to make it point sideways to move the lens over get in behind it and lift it up but once you're in that position i must stop and put, and comment on iris prolapse that was because of flow so flow causes iris prolapse. Fluid going in, fluid coming out. And I think I missed in my cortex video a very important point, I'll put it in now, that it's the one time you would go in position zero in the eye. You know, you would go to position zero if you have iris prolapse, uh, let the fluid state fluid stabilize, the pressure equalize, then ease out. Otherwise, you always want to stay in position one in the eye. Now here, we were able to seal the wound, we were able to get the iris back in the eye. But anytime you see iris prolapse, it, it never gets better. It just gets worse. So the, the more you fool with it, the worse the iris is going to be about prolapsing out of the eye. So the idea is to get it back in in as few steps as possible. And once the wound is sealed, uh, don't touch it again. Uh, if you need to put a stitch in, you can. But if the wound seals and the iris is not uh, near the surgical wound, it's, it's not necessary because sometimes... You'll go to put a stitch in a sealed wound. It'll it will unseal, it'll be burped. The iris prolapses again, and you know now maybe you got a stitch through it. Now we got a real problem on our hands. So I'm going to make sure that I meticulously uh, hydrate without burping and without overpressurizing the eye because I don't want to create fl flow back out that wound. So position zero when you're doing eye. And, and at this point, we want to minimize flow. We want to make sure that we don't overpressurize the eye like we did the first time, which led to the iris prolapse. So we've gone over viscoelastic injection, uh, lens injection, removing viscoelastic from behind the lens. I will say we use cefuroxime as a standard in every case. If they're a cephalosporin allergy, we use Vigamox. I think probably either is fine. This has dramatically reduced our uh, endophthalmitis rate to something below one per 18,000, which is the number of cases we've done since we implemented intracamel antibiotics many years ago. Uh, have not seen endophthalmitis since. So I think that's a very important step, especially in training programs. Um, so now to hydration, hydration of the wounds. When I'm thinking about hydrating a wound, I'm thinking about the, the distance from the inner to the outer portion of the wound. 
And I want to basically divide that in half. So let's say that the main wound is 2.5 millimeters long. I'm, I'm, I'm going at a point about 1.25 millimeters halfway. Uh, and I want to be as perpendicular as possible the, to the direction of the main wound. So, and I want to put place the tip of my cannula at that point, one half the distance between the inner and the outer edges of the wound. Uh, I don't want to move the eye around a lot, but I want to put enough pressure there to where it's very definitively in that position. And that's where I'm going to hydrate. And usually you can hydrate on one side with that method, then the other side of the main wound. The paracentesis can most times be hydrated just on one side. Uh, it's important while you're doing this not to push down because pushing down burps the wound. Um, so we want to be in a real neutral position. We don't want to lift up. We don't want to push down. We don't want to uh, uh, ram the cannula in there so hard that the eye has a lot of movement to it. Uh, but we want it. We still want it pressed in the uh, into the stroma enough that it's a a very good definitive seated position before the hydration starts. Now, a common source of a main wound leak is the inner leaflet of the wound, especially if it has like a triangular edge on it, can flip back out. So it would be the lower portion of the wound can flip back out the wound, and even if you've done a good hydration, it will keep leaking. It'll persistently leak even at a normal pressure. And my partner calls it a dirty burp. I don't know what the uh, official term for it is. But basically what you want to do is lower the pressure in the eye, burp some, this, some BSS out of the main wound, and then put some back in without putting the cannula all the way in. Just barely let some flow come back in, and that inner leaflet will flip back the way it should go so it's not rolled back out of the wound, and the wound will suddenly seal, a wound that's been... Um, very cantankerous, if hydrate over and over, still leaks, that will suddenly seal it. Uh, the paracentesis, you know, you'll have a tendency to be pressurizing the eye with the paracentesis if you're not careful. So be cognizant of that because it can cause what you just saw, which is iris prolapse in a case that hasn't had any problem with iris prolapse the whole case. The last step is intracameral antibiotic injection. That's done after everything else is done. I have seen videos where somebody will inject the uh, intracameral antibiotic, then they'll, hydr then they'll hydrate the wounds. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because you're usually diluting yourself. You, I think it needs to be the last step once the wounds are sealed. I have to give credit to Uday Devgan. He showed us a great trick in our OR once uh, to seal a wound that is persistently leaky at the end of the case. You know, anytime I have a leaky wound, first I want to check the pressure. I want to make sure the pressure is not 50 because even a nice tight wound will leak up with a pressure of 50. So make sure the pressure is relatively physiologic. If it's still leaking, you can hydrate some more. Check for the inner leaflet. Rotate it in. Do a little dirty burp. Let it flow back in, and a lot of times that will seal it. If it's still leaking, don't put a stitch yet. Take a wex cell. Soak the wex cell completely in tetracaine if you have access to it where it's dripping off the end of the wex cell. Hold it on the wound for one minute. The theory behind this is that uh, compared to corneal stroma, tetracaine is hypotonic. Um, water flows to the relatively hypertonic stroma, and it will diffusely hydrate around the wound in places that you can't just directly hydrate with the BSS cannula. Uh, that will save you a lot of stitches. I think there's some debate over whether we're just waiting longer and the time you're sitting there causes edema to happen anyway. I really feel like that's not the case, that tetracaine actually has some sealing effect through whatever mechanism, um, but it's been a great trick. It's saved me a whole lot of sutures. But I think that the question of whether to put a stitch or not is if you've done those things and it's still leaking or you think it's unstable and you think about putting a stitch, put a stitch. It's sort of like Tripan Blue. If you think about using Tripan Blue, use Tripan Blue. If you think you might need to use iris hooks for a small pupil or a Malugan ring, use the dilating device. So if you're thinking about doing it, it probably means that you should. And the same would be true for a stitch at the end of the case. So here we're going behind the lens, centering the lens back up by just pushing down on the center of it.
These optics are pretty tough. This works well, even with light adjustable lens, it works fine. We'll have a separate video up at some point rotating toric lenses into the proper position, but it's similar to what we were just doing. I think it is worth thinking about where your haptics are uh, when you put the lens in the eye to make sure that they're not blocking you from going behind the lens. If there's a small piece of cortex left, you can take it uh, at this point. With the lens in the eye, sometimes that's safer. And, and you want to bring the lens over to the cortex with you. And sometimes if the cortex is especially sticky, you can rotate the lens 180 or 360 um, to loosen the cortex. But you don't want to push the lens away. Let's imagine you've got sub-incisional cortex. You don't want to push the lens, dis the IOL that is, distal to the wound to go try to get that. You want to bring that lens with you and preferably take a haptic over there because that protects you from bringing posterior capsule forward while you're towing in and reaching underneath the surgical wound to get that last piece of remaining cortex. So I see people push the lens away. Don't do that. Bring it with you. Lens is in the posterior capsule. Remember, we don't have to keep pointing down once it's under that anterior capsule leaflet. Distally. I'm thinking about where these haptics are. I'm sure they're not going to block me when I want to go behind the lens. I'm rocking in the anterior chamber. This is basically floored. I've got the foot pedal to the floor, aggressively rinsing all the viscoelastic out. Now I'm going to nudge the lens over out of the way. Just as much movement as I need. I'm looking straight down that port as I remove the viscoelastic from behind it because I know that's safe. I can't get posterior capsule, th capsule there. Final rinse in the anterior chamber, go into position one because I don't have iris prolapse. But if I did, I would have gone to zero and come out slowly rather than coming out quickly. Picking a point halfway between the inner and outer edges of that wound, going as perpendicular as I can. Hydrating, that's the dirty burp. A little bit of fluid back through to get that inner leaflet rolled in. Hydrating one half of my paracentesis should be adequate. Checking with my wex cells. They're sealed tight. Cephiroxime, intracameral. Hope everybody's enjoyed this video series. This is the final one, uh, six of six. Thanks for watching CyberSight, and please give us your feedback. If you enjoyed this, please share it.